pit your bundles, your bundles. Mm -hmm. uh, please help us out here. You, every time you come here, you give us the twigs in the bundles, <laughs> and uh, you've done very well for yeah. the business community. Maybe you can uh, yeah. point us in the right direction. So, so I, I think what Alec is referring to is the way I look at uh, the portfolios I manage. I look at it like a bundle of twigs that each individual stock can be quite brittle and can break quite easily. But if you tie these stocks together in a portfolio, it makes quite a strong bundle. And it's important I say that because when I name some stocks just now, don't go rush out and just buy these stocks. Um, because they, I think they're cheap. I think they're undervalued. But as I said, you know, um, stocks get cheap when diversity break, breaks down or when there's a strong consensus. And the consensus might be right, might not be wrong. So um, I can be wrong on any of these stocks. But currently, I think there are, in my bundle of twigs, there's a very strong element of what I call undervalued investment companies, investment holding companies. Companies that have a long track, rec track record of outperforming the market. Their net asset value growth has outperformed the market. In other words, their management has been able to invest the equity of the business in projects, companies, uh, business endeavors, endeavors that are better than the market, and they perform better than the market, but these stocks are trading at a big discount to net asset value. So net asset value grows faster than the market, but you can buy it at a big discount. And I think that's, that's a fantastic situation for any investor to, to look at. Companies like HCI, for instance, run by Johnny Copeland. I think I've mentioned this one before. It's run by Johnny Copeland, and he is an astute, astute investor, as, as good as they come. His net asset value has grown by, I think it's, 10% per annum better than this JSE over time, yet you can buy HCI if you value all the assets appropriately. The disc, uh, discount is narrow just recently because of the oil prospects, but up until three months ago, you could buy it at a 56% discount, and it's still, I think, at about a 40% discount to net asset value. Another one is Savvest, Savvest Capital, run by Chris Seabrook, who is another astute investor, has grown his NAV, or his company's NAV, buy a lot more than the stock exchange, than JC or share index. And it's available at about a 40% discount to NAV. So that, that type of company, um, I think, is something to look at um, in your bundle of twigs. Um, another one I think interesting opportunity has just come up recently is Telcom. Uh, Telcom is not a highly regarded business. Um, its management have not excelled at generating value for shareholders over the past 10 years. But it does own the biggest fiber network in the country, by far the biggest fiber network in the country. Uh, and fiber, uh, getting data through fiber is what we all want. The nice thing about fiber is you can pump as many gigabytes or whatever the size of the data is through, a, you can make it bigger the whole time. Copper cables and those sort of things have a limited capacity to carry data. Fiber, it's almost unlimited. And they've got the biggest network, fiber to them network in the country. Um, and that's a valuable asset and is one that is not earning them very much at the moment because it's mainly dormant. They've, they've laid the fiber, but they haven't got the clients. There are other businesses out there that have got lots of clients, but they haven't got as much fiber, and they are willing to pay a premium for this. And you've seen it already with MTN saying they're interested in telecom, and Rain has also said they're interested in telecom. So it's not unlike there the bidding war can uh, kick off for telecom over time. So that's another one, uh, that's another interesting investment idea, I think. Thanks for that, Pete, because uh, Charles Savage was also saying nice things about telecom. I was very ugly about them, but no. uh, I think I'll put that one side. <laughs> it's perception. <laughs> perceptions are negative, perceptions are important. That's where stocks get cheap when you have negative perceptions. So that's mm. it's a very important attribute of cheap stocks. That's those twigs. You, you, know, you, you take them out individually, they're all ugly, and they're all brittle, and the people don't like them. But together, they're strong. Performance fees. Mm. Well, very, yeah. So, so this is something we thought about a lot. Um, and we did it away with our performance. We did have performance fees in our funds up until about seven years ago. And seven we years ago? Yeah, seven years ago. Okay. Uh, and um, we got rid of them, uh, mainly because we just thought that it's almost a form of double dipping. I mean, if you're managing money for a client and they're paying you a ad valorem fee, a percentage fee on the assets you're managing. If you do well in, growing the, in, in, in managing those assets, your earnings will go up. 
you don't need to have a performance fee on top of that. Um, so, you know, and we do think that a lot of the bigger investment firms have lost sight of their fiduciary responsibilities to their clients because their eye is on the bottom line and growing that bottom line. Um, and we think if you focus on the client, over time the client will look after you. Um, and uh, we'd rather do a better job for the client um, and have a business probably grow slower, but, uh, but delivers value. Because um, we think the investment industry as a whole has lost sight of what they're there for. And I can go on about that for a long time, but I think in short, that, that is it. Do, do you support what Sean is doing? Very much so. Very, I think Sean's doing a great job in highlighting this. Uh, and I think you will see that the big investment firms are going to fight back hard. I think uh, Sean is in for a fight. But I support every word of what he says about this issue. Remember, these big investment firms are massively profitable. Massively profitable. I said earlier, asset management firms are highly scalable businesses. So they can spend a lot of money in marketing. That's why you know, they don't mind spending a bit of their fees on advertising of airports and making nice TV adverts and all those sort of things. Things to make you feel comfortable while they're taking your money. They're very good at that. Trust is earned. Yeah, we're not going to name specific names, but you've seen the ads at the airport. You've seen those sort of things. Uh, that's your money they're spending there. It's your money. But that's, that's an extraordinary tagline for coronation. Trust is earned. Anyway, it is what it is. Uh, you've been to the exclusive book stand, I hope. Yeah, I have. There's some really good books there. Uh, I think the, my, my favorite book there is um, the one by Philip Fisher. Um, Stocks for the long term, uh, common stocks. Common stocks with un common st uncommon, uncommon profits. profits from common stocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah by yeah. Philip Fisher, a great book. That, uh, it's one of the first books I read when I was trying to find out how this whole investing thing works when I was like 20 years old, 25 years old. Mm. I think it's a fantastic book. Yeah. Before the intelligent investor. Before then, I read that before the intelligent investor. Yeah. So, but if 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 you were a brand new investor, mm. would those two books maybe a uh, a uh, good cornerstones for you? I think so. I think those those two books, and and I think also um, there's a book by Howard Marks called um, uh, what is his book called? Uh, oh, I made a note of it. L I've got it here. Yeah, I've oh, got it here. you made a note. Of it. I did make a note. Yeah, Howard Marks, a guy from Oak Tree, um, mm. and his book is called The Most Important Thing. Um, I think that also in terms of developing your own investment philosophy and investment process. That's a fantastic book to read as well. I don't know how many years ago, and you can tell us when it was, you brought Robert Caldini out to mm, South Africa. That's right, yeah. And there's a book of his there called awesome Influence. Book, yeah. Talk yeah. us through that. So I, I think his book um, is, I, I think it's important just in your day-to-day um, -day goings. It's not really an investment book, but it's just a, a book on how to get what you want in life without, you know, using force or violence. Uh, and, uh, you know, reciprocity and uh, uh, giving people gifts and, you know, those are tools that he outlines in, the book, in his book and how to use them to get what you want in negotiations and other things as well. So I, I, I thought he really said, important. this is what you've got to watch out for when people are influencing you. <laughs> but uh, what was he like when you brought him to... So, sorry, before we go there. Yeah. Uh, this book was one of those recommended at the Berkshire Hathaway AGM, yeah. which, by the way, Pete Fulyun is responsible for taking all us, us all there. He was the first one to go there. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's got a, a little tribe that actually follows it. But uh, Warren uh, Buffett and Charlie Munger used to make a habit of recommending at least one book there. Mm -hmm. And the one year they recommended Influence by Robert Caldini. And uh, it wasn't long afterwards that Pitt brought him out to South Africa. Wh what was he like as a, as a person? Well, no, he, he, was very, he, he was a very amenable person, a nice person to talk to, uh, gracious. Uh, we had dinner with him the night before his talk that we hosted. And... Um, a very gracious person, uh, a, a nice human being. I, you know, I can't say much more than that. Authentic. Uh, I'd say so, yeah. 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 I think that's uh, that's something that we try to see throughout here, authenticity. What about Outsiders by Thorndike? Thorndike, that's another book, Outsiders. Uh, I think that's... Uh, and uh, and th I'm sure exclusive books can get you this book. It's not there now because they asked me to give them a list of books, but I wasn't prepared for it at that time. 
But if you can get hold of a book by Will and Ariel Durant called The Lessons of History, I think that is an amazing book. It's 100 pages. It's a very short read. And the people who have exclusive books, I'm sure they'll be able to get it for you. Um, it's a wonderful book. And if you, if you do nothing else this Christmas holiday, take that book and read it. Uh, it's fantastic. That's a fantastic uh, recommendation. Who's going to start the questions from the audience? There we go. One. Sorry, where I... It's a bit difficult. Ah, there we go. There's Mick here. Question there. If you want the microphone, please wave. Shall we start? Start with you, Mick. No, no, don't fiddle with it. Just speak. <laughs> I, I remember asking Richard Brasher to stand up once when he was, in fact, standing up. He was only this high. So I'm embarrassed to be standing up at my height. Uh, Pete, I, I obviously... Being followers of Biz News, we know about this competition that they've set up between you and Magnus. Um, are you still largely weighted locally uh, in your own business, or, mm. or are you, are you, have, are, have you had second thoughts about this? Yeah, yeah. And, and what's Magnus doing? Is he still very strongly um, uh, internationally focused? Microphone close, please. Internationally yeah. focused. Yeah, so, so, the, so the bet was a five-year bet of local versus offshore. Magnus picked some offshore funds, and I picked the counterpoint value fund, the fund I manage. And that's it. We've set it five years. We're not changing it or doing anything to it. Those are the two assets that are running against each other for a five-year period. Uh, so in terms of that, uh, I, I'm still very much 100% South Africa. I, I do think um, investors should, each, each investor has, has his or her own risk profile. And um, I, I'm not I don't think, I think it'd be very foolhardy to have all your assets in South Africa. I I'm not a proponent of that. I think you should be diversified internationally. How much is up to each individual? If your benchmark is zero South Africa, right now I'd probably have 10 or 20% in South Africa because the assets are so cheap. Um, other people will have more, others might have less. But I think there's a place for South African assets because what uh, Rob was speaking about this morning is well known. I mean, the market has factored this, these things into the share prices. You know, if the ANC does something stupid tonight, it, that is not a surprise. That's <laughs> to be expected. And that, you know, those things are in the share prices. The share prices are discounting continued governmental stupidity. I mean, that's, you know, what is not expecting is positive news. You know, so, you know, so, um, so, what Rob was speaking about this morning is not a reason not to invest. The only reason not to invest is that assets are very expensive, like they are in the US at the moment. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with the bet. Uh, I wouldn't, if, if I was given the opportunity to change my bet today, I wouldn't change it. I'd keep it the same. I think assets locally are very cheap, and assets in the US um, are very, very expensive. So I'm very comfortable. Is there anything worked into the South African asset prices of a transformation post-2024? In other words, where you'd have a government who, who doesn't shoot itself in the foot all the time? I don't think so, no. If I look at the, if I look at the, the opportunities available uh, for investment in small and medium-sized businesses on the stock exchange, they are pricing in continued slow economic growth, continued over-regulation, continued uh, red tape, uh, continued empowerment schemes, continued Cater deployment, that's what they're discounting. You know, that's why you can buy great businesses like CMH is another fantastic business. One of the best businesses on the stock exchange on a PE of five or six, dividend yield of seven, eight percent. You can actually, if you have a mortgage, you can actually borrow money on your mortgage. Don't do this. But you can <laughs> borrow money on your mortgage, take money out your mortgage, and invest in a group of stocks, and the dividends will be higher than your interest rate in your mortgage. A group of small and medium sized companies. That's how cheap they're on that. That's how much bad stuff they're discounting. Uh, thanks. Uh, Pete, just curious of your career. Sorry, it's oh, been here. I, yeah. um, what has been your best of your career, the best portfolio return investment that you've had? Uh, you know, uh, Bill, uh, Ben Graham had Geico, which was a growth business. Uh, Warren Buffett had, you know, Apple, which has been fantastic as a portfolio size. Has it been a statistically cheap company or has it been an intrinsically growing company that's mm. been your best investment? Yeah. So, so in, in terms of the funds that I manage, uh, the best performing stocks have always been intrinsically cheap companies. Um, just recently, Tungela is one that, that I bought when it listed originally and that's been a 15-bagger in the space of a year. 
Um, and that was when it listed was... What is a 15 bagger? It went up by a factor of 15 times. So it went from... 25 rand to 380 rand. In a year? In a year. Um, That's more. But it's a, coal mi it's a coal mine, you know, and a lot of people don't want to invest in coal mines. Um, uh, Are you still there? Are you still Yes, I still own it. I've owned less of it, uh, but I still own it. I still own it. I think there's a, there is a significant investment opportunity in... Uh, uh, Anti Greta, what's her surname? Anti Greta. Thul Thunberg. Thornberg, yeah. yeah. Thornberg. So anything that she's against, I'll invest in because I think those things are cheap. And that, that's not new. Uh, Pete's been at, on the ESG or the anti ESG yeah. trail for a while. Where is the ESG big thing is a diversity breakdown. People mm. are not thinking clearly, they are ignoring the laws of physics. Um, and um, they think there's some magic fairy dust that will make a lot of stuff happen, which is not going to happen. You're going to you're gonna end up cold and hungry like Europe and California if you believe in this magic fairy dust ESG stuff, and I think it creates massive investment opportunities if you're willing to take it. And, and, and it, the big investment houses are selling you ESG products. That's how you know you must run away from you. That's why, how you know you must do the opposite. And they probably have performance fees too. Yeah. I mean, uh, Bruce, thanks, but a view, what is your opinion on Bitcoin? Has anything changed since the last time we spoke? And mm. do you foresee maybe investing more in that? I know you've got a very tiny mm. exposure. Yeah, I do have exposure to Bitcoin. I, I don't know. I still don't know. There's a lot of stuff I don't know about. Bitcoin is one of them. Um, I still have a small exposure. I do know that there are a lot of very smart people backed by very rich people that are doing a lot of work on Bitcoin and blockchain related technology. And I think something has to stick. At some point, something will stick and something will make a difference and there will be uh, significant developments happening there. Um, so I think it does have a future. I just don't know what it is right now. It's, you know, um, but I think there's, they're gonna find uh, the unique, uh, USP for it at some point. So do you buy it as an insurance? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, it's, it's another twig in the bundle. It might, you know, it might go to naught. Um, Bitcoin might be a big scam or uh, I, I don't know. Therefore, I'll allocate a small portion of my portfolio to because it could, it might turn out to be a fantastic thing. It's another twig in the bundle of twigs.